Three, two, one. Welcome back, guys. It's Swole Nation Bros. Today we've got Lord Elliot. Um, from from what I have down is, let me know if I'm correct. You are a longtime com competitor. You're a gym owner. You're, you are an educator because you do take your time in a teaching other coaches how to coach, right? Yes. Um, that's pretty much. And you are also the national. USP head coach. Correct. Cool. Out of all that, what, like, what's like your favorite thing you're most, you're most passionate about? Uh, teaching. You know, I, I, I always had a, I always wanted to be a teacher. I, I, I thought being a high school teacher, a PE teacher, phys ed teacher would be the ideal job for me. I really thought it would be one of the best things to do. So after I got my bachelor's degree, I uh, went ahead and got my master's degree and I tried to take the uh, CBS test to see, you know, uh, become a substitute teacher on my way to get my teacher's credentials. But one of the biggest things I have is, is I'm dyslexic. I'm severely dyslexic. I was diagnosed in seventh grade. I did special education classes in eighth grade. Okay. And then uh, my high school year, I was kind of left alone to just practice the techniques and skills I used in junior high. Uh, it's been a challenge for me my entire life. It's been a challenge for me in school and come testings, especially when they're time tested, uh, I don't do very well. So I could not pass the exam to become a teacher. So what I ended up doing was creating a uh, the USPA program, mm -hmm. uh, collaborating with Tom DeLong. And the success of it's been what it is today. But my, probably my biggest joy was teaching, being a, a college instructor at yeah. uh, Barber Business College. And I did that for four years, uh, teaching exercise science and business classes. That's awesome. That's cool. I mean, you, you can already tell like, right off the bat you love the sport. Yeah. You, once you get in it, it's hard to get out because you enjoy it. I mean, for me, I'm a, you, you, I, I met you at a competition. I forgot where, but I was one of the spotter and loaders. And even though I'm a spotter and loader, the whole time I'm like, this is awesome. Yeah. Like, this is awesome. Because you want to see if the guy gets it, and you hope the guy gets it. Right. As a spotter, I'm like, please don't. I'm like, yeah. That's just me. Please don't drop it right on me. Um, so I did ask on Swole Nation Bros, I asked a couple, I asked a question. I was like, what would you guys like to ask Lord on the podcast? And some of them are funny, some of them are true. <laughs> uh,. Okay, one of them was, what's next for NAS Power? Okay, so we've come a long way in the short period of time. I, I feel, you know, I opened up the gym. Uh, we were about 2,800 square feet, 2,500 square feet. We were sharing space with a CrossFit gym. And we opened it with $56,000 all on credit cards. Wow. Um, when the day we opened, I kind of sat there in a chair and said, okay, it's five o'clock in the morning and Nobody's in my gym, and we I opened it at 5 a.m. And I said to myself, did I just make a mistake? Mm -hmm. It's one of the greatest things was putting it together. You can design a phenomenal product, but if you don't have customers, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's kind of like, big, yeah. you know, you need customers. So <laughs> work got out, and the growth of NAS Power started with the education system. So in 2014, I started creating, I started with Tom DeLong instructing the uh, USPA coaches certification. Uh, that took off. And in 2015, I went to Steve Dennison and said, I really want to know more about powerlifting. A lot of people know from the, from, uh, from the history of California powerlifting. My mm -hmm. father was the chairman for USPF yeah. in the 90s. When he retired, Steve Dennison uh, replaced him in the USPF. So I followed along with Steve Dennison and uh, followed along with him to the USPA. Well, I had a significant amount of experience with my father and I said to Steve, I think it's time for me to really learn more, to do more for the sport and get this experience becoming a meet director. And so three weeks later, he, he approved it. I put my business plan together, he approved it. And we had three meets at the CrossFit gym that I ended up opening my gym in. Okay. 
and those three meets were phenomenal. They, it, we were packed, 58 lifters, 65 wow. lifters. That's, a, that's uh, a whole meet. Just in a push-pull. Just in a push-pull? Just in a push-pull. That's how I started That's how I started practicing becoming a meet director is I put on push-pulls. That kind of led to, hey, Lord, in the latter part of 2015, I was approached by the CrossFit gym. Would you like to take over some of this area space? Mm -hmm. So we did. And we opened up NAS Power training center so we had the education system we had we had the meat productions going and now we have the uh, training center and it's gonna be a really long way yeah That's so awesome. in one year just because of meat promotions here in Bakersfield mm -hmm. uh, one year we started planning to grow another 2,500 square feet which we did uh, there was a suite next door we took it over and then over the summer uh, we went ahead and grew up to 7,200 square feet. Uh, so, you know, that was, that, was, that was a big step for us. Yeah. Um, it was an exciting step. I think we're just going to grow the program at NAS Power and focus on the members that we have. That's awesome. Um, and focus on the members we have. Uh, you, know, we, 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 you know, it's January. We had a significant amount of new members come in. To, yeah, this is the time where everyone starts. Yeah. You know, and, and well, our program's a little different, you know, mm -hmm. powerlifting's different. Yeah. People want to feel stronger. People want to get stronger. It's immediate results. It's immediate feedback to you. You, you grow five pounds of uh, strength and you say to yourself, wow, that was incredible. I hit a PR. How much more can I do? Mm -hmm. Well, let's train. You know, so it's immediate feedback. It's a lot. It, it, it's, it's definitely more positive feedback than losing how long it takes to lose a pound, how long does it takes to lose two pounds, mm -hmm. you know? So that's the incredible thing about straight sports. So when it comes to NAS power, we're gonna focus on that. That's and awesome. The drive and, and the products of, of uh, meat directing, mm -hmm. uh, putting on more meat. So here in the Central Valley, uh, 2015, I was told, or 2016, Lord, you are now the Central, the Central Valley uh, meat director. So we were only running three to four meets uh, based out of Bakersfield, and we had one meet running in San Luis Obispo by another meet director, and uh, I ended up taking that over, but we're up to 11 this year, just in the Central California. You guys are busy. So we did 11 this year, we're gonna do six down in Southern California, Ventura, and LA. Cool. So, do, you, so. do you ever think, I, cause I know you're really uh, client oriented, I know, you want to build up the people, you want to build up your gym and the programs, but do you ever think you would open up another location? We have thought about that. So business is really, uh, it's, it's, it's really hard to gauge, especially in our, in our product, the uh, yeah. powerlifting product. You have boutique centers and then you have global gym. Mm -hmm. Boutique centers are specialty centers like personal training boxes. Um, boot camp boxes, uh, global, and, and, and then powerlifting boxes. They charge anywhere from $50 a month to $100 a month plus, you know? Yeah. Um, and then you have the global gyms, which charges, you know, Planet Fitness, 10 bucks a month, or, you know, you have In Shape City, In Shape City, or, or 24, 24 hour, hour, you know, it's 50, 60 bucks a month. Mm -hmm. But the program, the products inside the gym, in the global gyms are the same. Planet Fitness and 24 Hour Fitness are practically the same. Uh, how much free weights you have, that makes a difference, but you go to somewhere like, you know, NAS Power. Uh, the significant amount of kilo plates we have. Uh, and, and also other gyms, uh, don't wanna, you know, not mention other gyms, but uh, uh, you got Barbell Brigade, Lock It Out Barbell, uh, here in the Central Valley. You have uh, Grizz's Powerhouse. I mean, it just, the list, you know. It goes on and on. It goes on and on. Yep. Slow Strong out there in San Luis Obispo. Um, we specialize, and we ha it's very expensive, and we don't have the global gym customers. We yeah. don't have the 8,000 customers. Yeah, because not everyone has their own powerlifting order. Right. Or they, their goal is to cut down and lean and tone and. Right. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, and they never do. Yeah, they never do, right? <laughs> they never do. In see January, you next year. Next year. Yeah, next year. Yeah, see you next year. That's my 2020 resolution, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, with these boutique boxes, 
you know, with NASCAR and the boutique boxes, I kind of looked at the business product. And I kind of copied, I, I traveled up north to Old School Iron, and then um, even as far down south as um, met up with Jason Kelsky out there at uh, you know, Game Time Strength. And I, I met with a couple other people and looked at their business models, and I took a little bit of each. That kind of created your kind own. Kind of created my own. So I wanted, I wanted to be the global gym box with the specialty of powerlifting. So we have oh, almost 800 members. That's cool. That's in like, our gym, that's quite a bit. Yeah. So, and that well, the whole purpose was that is to have lower dues, great service because it's only ran by its owners, uh, myself, Peyton, and and uh, my partner Tim and his wife Mandy, and as well as my head strength coach. Uh, Evan Snyman. So we're the only ones that run the gym and we have that personal touch. That's awesome because not everyone's got their hands in the... No. You know, in the bowl. No. So that was the whole point of NASCAR is to bring in more athletes into the meets. Bring, introduce people to... A whole new world. A whole new world of... Yeah. of you know, what I, what I get from the sport, I want other people to experience that. Yeah. And, you know, other people are going to want to experience CrossFit. Other people are going to want to experience uh, um, Spartan races. That's great. But for me, I want, I want to introduce the community, powerlifting to the community, and show how strength sports and strength training can really be a benefit in your life. Just, just, just in confidence alone. And it teaches you so much. Like, for yeah. me, it teach, it teach me how to stay consistent mm -hmm. in, like, training and everything, which is awesome. And... That, that's why I, that's kind of why I started the podcast because I want to show people hey there's more than physique or bodybuilding there's this whole new world because when I started training I started training with Chris for Broken Iron yeah and just in the hour that I was training with him he fixed my my, my foot stance which is a whole new thing and I've heard you talk about it the foot stance goes a long way you know the way I hold my the bar on my back everything so that one hour was like Okay, I love this. Like, let's yeah, let's stay here. Let's do this. Let's yeah. do this, and that's what I want other people to. I want to show other people. You yeah, know? exactly. It's a whole new, it's a whole new thing. There's so much to learn, and, and learning keeps you engaged. And yeah, there's discovery. Yes, you know, there's there's a thing in, in, in psychology about self discovery and how amazing you have these epiphanies, you have these moments, you have these aha moments. It's just like popcorn popping in your head, like aha. <laughs> wow, you know, if I only knew this years ago, if I only knew this months ago. Well, powerlifting is very much like that. There's many sports that are like that, but we specialize in powerlifting. So. Yeah, this is what we found. This, is what, this we, is what we found. Yeah. So if someone said you're super inspirational, they just, <laughs> just want to let you know that they're, Thanks. they're, <laughs> that they're super inspirational. Um, can you be my dad? That's what. That's one of the questions. Was, can you be my dad? Um, and those those calves those calves do how <laughs> how <laughs> so there's they asked how do you get calves right. so <laughs> there it goes back to I figure it's a question because they they were like oh my god <laughs> so I I actually just recently made a joke about this but this goes back to my sister okay and my sister always used to, my sister and my father had the best calves in the world it was like Arnold Schwarzenegger calves it was. Um, you know, my father could wear shorts and boom, his calves just pop out. They're shredded, they're lean, they're shaped. He's got the heart. You know, he has he that feel for it. right? Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah. Still is a Marine. Oh, so, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. I, <laughs> sorry, sorry. Let me clarify yeah, that. I apologize to so, the Marines. I, I'm sorry, guys. Um, you know, and then there's my sister. My sister always had these phenomenal calves. And I had my mother's calves. We're like runners. Mm -hmm. So I was teased so much about it that I literally training three days a week on them. You know, I, again, I started in my junior years. Was, when I was 12 years old, I, my father took me to the gym, but at 13, he he started training me at 13. Right when I turned 13, uh, we actually lied at the gym, said I was 14 because you had to be 14. So. Yeah. <laughs> so, my sister always teased me, and I just had this drive, this, this desire to have, you know what, I'm going to have these awesome calves. And... I trained and I trained and I trained and I trained and finally they started developing hypertrophy wise and, and that's how it happened. I was teased. So it was just teased enough? 
I was teased, and so, I, I wish they. You know what? I wish I wish someone taught uh, teased me about my stomach because I'd probably have a killer six pack. Right guys, now, continue but. teasing me about my stomach. That's how they're gonna grow, guys. Help me. <laughs> so, but uh, yeah, that's how that's how the whole calf thing came around. And, Dude, that's crazy. And uh, you know, I I still train them, but uh, I still don't do sit ups. So. <laughs> <laughs> so your first competition was at Venice Beach, right? Yeah, Venice yeah. Beach in 1990. Dude, you're from what uh, I'm trying to remember. It was a while back that I heard it, but like your number, your your number on the platform was like you were really really good for 14, 13 years old, man. Yeah, four, uh, right at 14 was a uh, was a uh, qualifying age to, in the USPF. Okay. Uh, back in 1990, and I had to wait till I turned 14, 14. and I remember I. I <laughs> I remember I started training at a weight of like 123 pounds. And when I went to weigh in, I weighed in at 138 pounds at the USPF uh, Junior State Championships in, in Venice Beach in 1990. And my squat was 352 pounds, my bench was 192. Wow. And my, my deadlift was uh, 396, I believe. Three that age, one, that's six. that's incredible, man. That's and yeah. at that weight class, that's props to you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> seriously, yeah, my, I you know it's props to my father. He was a phenomenal coach. True. I learned so many skill sets. You know, his life experiences, his life experiences in the Marine Corps and and just in martial arts. Uh, he applied a lot of that to the psychology of coaching me, and keeping my mind straight, keeping my head straight. Uh, you know, I, I, I remember one time I threw, took his belt off and I threw it on the ground and I threw a fit. And, you know, he's a, he's, he was a drill sergeant in the, in the Corps after Vietnam. And I remember, I remember his eyes, I remember his face, and I, I remember the sound of his voice. And, and, and if you can just think about a, a dog just barking at you, just like, drooling and his jaw got bigger and his teeth got longer <laughs> I'm just like ooh you know that's I'm scared it, for it. my life <laughs> um that was the last time I ever threw a fit yeah no I believe I think you. I was I think I was 15 years old and I was I mean I'm even watering up in the eyes thinking about it but I was probably 15 years old and that was the last time I ever threw a fit um missing lifts um you know being frustrated being angry I, I've never thrown a fit and that's good that's good that you dad instilled that into you yeah. you know like so he taught you like you know if you miss a fit it's, if you miss a lift it's okay like, it's you okay you don't have yeah. to go yeah. crazy about it he was really big into analyzing he could break he can analyze you know he's an E9 in the core so these guys they have to be really great at being able to analyze a situation uh, come up with solutions and that this is a pattern he's taught me my entire life um, so he would break me down and say don't do that. Mm -hmm. And I just, well, how do I do it? He's like, well, he, he, he did it this way. Don't do it that way. Do it this way. And let's figure out how to get there. Okay. It was that easy. It was that easy. So he would always make me be in the moment. Uh, he would always, you know, like he would throw, I remember uh, teaching martial arts. He would throw a punch at me. Mm -hmm. He's like, okay, you didn't move and I hit you. <laughs> okay, well, don't do that. Make sure you move next time. So I always had to be in the moment, and I always had to analyze and be able to recall what it's like to be in the moment, every nanosecond of motion and movement and, and being able to be aware of everything around you. So that was huge, you know? And I, te I brought that into, I bring that into the coach's course because when your coach asks you, what happened? How come you missed that? That's, that's what you should have done. And he and, does that. <laughs> and if he if you say to him, I don't know, I don't remember, you know, that's not good. So you need to be able to be so in tune with your body that you control every motion in your body, every subsystem of muscle contraction in your body. And if you don't get something, you've got to be able to be able to report it back to your coach. Hey coach, this is what I did, this is what happened, this is why. Can you help me figure this out? And I haven't mastered that, but I'm slowly starting yeah. to get better at it. And with time, I will, but I see what you mean. Yeah. And it's, it's really cool that he instilled that into you, because not a lot of parents mm -hmm. do that. So, nope. blessed. Yeah. 
Seriously blessed. Um, oh, someone, I think it's a serious question, though. Uh, can you coach me, please, if someone wants you to coach them? Yeah, I... I, 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 I they're not from up here, so... I, I, I am severely booked. I do take people on, mostly because of, of just the people in my jam. Um, you know, uh, like this is Sunday. Sundays are usually my administration days. It's my quietest day. If I'm not gone, usually I'm gone. Last year I was gone uh, 36 weekends. Wow. I was gone 36 weekends last year, whether it was uh, refereeing the world or, or a world level meet, um, putting on powerlifting, directing powerlifting meets, uh, geez, you know, coaching, uh, doing coaching courses. Uh, I was two, two weeks in Europe, um, and then of course your holidays, but. Yeah, I was gone 36 weekends. So I'm extremely busy. When you do online coaching or, or when you do programming, um, having 25 clients is huge. That's a huge plate. Yeah. That's a very big plate to have 25 clients. So I have eight clients that I, I do uh, online coach. Um, they send me videos, they send me, we talk on the phone. We, we review, we, we yeah. analyze, we so we do everything. But I, I'm, it's it's just it's just too busy. It really is busy. No, I bet. Yeah. When you're coaching someone like online, do you think do you feel like it's harder to, to dissect the lift? Yeah. When there isn't it. Yep. Or just explain how to move the like how to do the proper movement. Correct. Yeah. It really is. Uh, because I'm not there, I have to. Sometimes we'll do the Skype. You know, mm -hmm. we'll, we'll go on Skype, go live on Skype, and I'll be in the moment with them. One of the hardest things I've always had to overcome, even in the coach's course, is the misunderstanding of what cues really mean. Um, a lot of people are taking cues today and don't even understand where those cues came from and the intent of the cue. So they take it for what it says, but they don't understand what it actually means. So by cues, you mean like... Uh, you know, chest out, chest or chest up in the squat. or chest up or yeah. So a lot of people are thinking, a lot of people think chest up in the squat means more of a of a vertical spine. Uh, chest up in the squat really means a thoracic. You know, your spine's broken down into three sections. So the thoracic, you have your lumbar, thoracic, and cervical. The thoracic extension, that's just the mid back, needs to be extended. So when people say chest up, it means thoracic extension. It doesn't mean more of a vertical spine. And I bet a lot of people don't even know, because I did not know that. I yeah. Didn't know that's what I meant. yeah. So when a lot of people do try to do a vertical spine, they end up doing more of an anterior hip tilt. So then that's what starts a whole butt week when they go down and up. And they're also, they're bracing falters because, you know, the rib, the rib alignment and the anterior pelvic tilt is down in the rib alignment is misaligned to where they both need to be in the same parallel line. So when you start to enter your tilt in your hip, now your core is breaking, your, your bracing is gonna break. That's interesting, uh, that's cool. So what does uh, close the door mean? <laughs> so. <laughs> I, I, was, I was just saying that to everything. <laughs> okay, so close the door. I actually heard this cue for the first time uh, in tech, when I taught in Texas. Yeah. Uh, Bobby Morgan, he was like, uh, shut the door. And I'm like, I just didn't understand shut the door. So Bobby Morgan ended up standing up and he quickly jerks his hip back like he's bumping the door with his butt. Shut the door. And shut the door means to, to break at the hip first in the squat. So you sit back first instead of breaking at the knee first. So where I always said, where do you break first? The knees or the hips. Mm -hmm. And... Bobby would say, like, shut the door. So that just meant the cue of sitting back with your hips before you break it, your knees. Okay. So, <laughs> okay. No, I, I'm like, okay. Yeah. All right, that works. I, I've heard, I've ever heard that a competition before, and I'm like, okay. Yeah. I'm like, okay, I'm like, I mean, I can't, I'm like, hey, before you go, yeah. what does that mean? Because I'm, I'm usually spotty. And. <laughs> that was pretty funny. Yeah, that was a pretty the funny. The whole class, only in Texas, right? So, does being so damn handsome add more strength oh, to, to your lift? No. 
25 pounds. <laughs> no. If I had a gauge, it is. <laughs> um, what was the most embarrassing thing Embarrassing thing that happened on the platform, if you uh, recall? I even talk about this. You know, I'm not a farter on a platform, so that's never happened to me. But back in the 90s and the 80s, it, powerlifting was all about your single ply. You're in single ply, single ply, single ply. So there was no such, really such thing as raw in the USPF, APF uh, organizations. Mm -hmm. um, so here I am, I'm 14 years old, and these single ply suits, I used to wear a marathon, and they're kind of skin tight. Um, and I remember having to go to the bathroom. I had to go pee. And it's just me in the porta potty. You know, you're in a tight porta potty, and you got this suit on, and you have to push it down. Yeah. Pass, you know, just to. Just mm -hmm. able to go. Yeah. yeah. Just to just to get your thing out, so you can go pee. Well, it was so tight I couldn't get past the hips low enough. So basically, here's my thing and. I barely got it out, but sticking up because I can't, I didn't have the material to push the material down so I can aim it down. So here I am. It's just shooting straight up to the back of the uh, back side of the porta potty. I'm oh, sorry. Yeah. So your vision, you're getting a good visual here. Yeah. So it's just shooting straight up to the back side of the porta potty, and as I you know start running empty, the stream's getting lower, 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 and then I end up peeing all over myself. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Because I was like, okay, okay, shut it off, shut it off, and then I come out with just my whole front end wet. And it was a, it was a navy blue suit, so navy blue, no, to, a little so, noticeable, yeah, and very noticeable. Yeah. You know, it would have been better if it was white, maybe yellow, but, uh, but yeah, that was probably my most embarrassing moment. I'm coming out, my sister, you know, I've got my shirt pulled out over the suit. My sister's like, what happened? And I told her story. She started laughing, really, really. Well, for me, um, I was spotting and loading one time, and I got there. I was gonna, I was running late, and I didn't get a chance to change into my shorts. Uh -huh. So I was like, whatever, I'll start right now. And when the, when I get a trade off with someone, I'll go back in. First, I think like first couple of squats, I went down. My jeans rip, just completely nice. rip, and it's it's a whole front view for everyone on the platform. Nice. So, yeah, everyone's like, oh, hey, man. I'm like, I know. Like, I feel the breeze. It's not like... <laughs> yeah. Nice. Congratulations. Congratulations. I'm like, hey, can I go real quick? <laughs> I'm like, I'll, I'll, I'll finish it, but I got to go. Jane. <laughs> I've had... I've only had one time where my suit split. Yeah. And I was getting ready. It was a Santa Barbara uh, Budweiser Classics. It was on, it was on the uh, boardwalk of Santa Barbara Beach. And my... As I squatted down into a sumo stance, um, deadlift, and, I, and all of a sudden it went, <laughs> just my whole rear end blew out. Now, my father always had me wear a jock strap. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, <laughs> just, yeah, I had nothing but, you know, a clear starfish for everybody to see. It was a show. <laughs> <laughs> you charged everyone, you were like, hey, And I just said, oh, everyone. well, you know, and I just put my butt down, lifted it put it down and there was a photo of taken of me of actually grabbing my rear end laughing. So I, I have that photo somewhere. It would be fun to see it again. <laughs> no, yeah, that's what I did. I just, I laughed it off. I'm like, yeah. what am I going to do? It happens. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, after everyone was like, hey, dude, are you okay? Right. Like, you, I'm like, no, I'm good. It happens, yeah. man. I can't be mad about it. <laughs> so, has, I mean, I'm, I, right now I'm training in single play. Yeah. So I'm training in, you know, the bench dude. The first time, I mean, going into the suit was a whole new experience for me. Right. Because I was like, is this supposed to feel like this? Is this supposed to feel like this? But, I mean, after a while, I'm getting used to it. I'm learning how to go down on my deadlift, yeah. all that good stuff. Do you think that, like, the way that the single ply is made, is, has it changed? Has it got stronger? Because, like, it's, since you started training? Yeah. It's yeah? definitely advanced. Um, there's, there's suits that kind of give you a rebound effect. And then there's suits that have very much of a stopping effect. So the rebound effect is kind of where the suit has a little bit of a give, mm -hmm. but there's so much strain energy in that suit that it rebounds you really right. nice, but it allows you to uh, hit the sweet spot in the hole. Uh, but there, that strain energy just, boom, just the elastic strain energy just contracts as you come up and, and it really adds a significant amount of uh, pounds to your total. 
So does the stopping power ones. They don't stretch, mm -hmm. like uh, Rage X shirts, uh, Rage X bench shirts. They don't stretch. They just compress into your body. It'll take. I mean, those shirts. Uh, it can bench over a thousand pounds. Yeah. Once so you if you're only benching three to four hundred pounds, that shirt is not stretching. It's just compressing into your ribs. So these stopping power. You, you, know, you definitely have to understand that it's going to break into your skin. It's going to break into your tissues. And you just, it's just, it is what it is. And that's just what you do. Uh, so, yes, it, it's it's pretty significant, especially the bench press shirts. Uh, and, and especially the single ply suits as well as multi ply suits. But it's a, it's a strength training tool for those who train raw, for those who only train classic raw. Single ply tools, single ply products, uh, multi ply products should be used to train for raw. It mm -hmm. should be used to train for classic raw. Here's the reason why. How many people purchase slingshots, you know, for okay. benching? Yeah. And the purpose is overload. So the overload theory is you have 100% of that weight in your hands, okay? As you come down, the, it's still 100% of the weight in your hands. It's, it's deloading off the triceps. It's deloading the stress and strain off the pecs. But it's still the, the, the weight and the bearing of the weight, the compression of the force is still bearing on you. So nothing really deloaded from the ground like chains and bands would. Mm -hmm. So you still have 100% of the weight and you push it up and blah, blah, blah. Well, same thing for knee wraps. Knee wraps will deload the stress off the quadriceps, okay? Uh, deload the strength energy off the, but it still applies a lot of the overload to the hips. So you can, and it still applies a lot of overload to the spine and the control of, of the spine. Um, you take the knee wraps off, you put a single ply, let's just say you put a squat briefs on. Mm -hmm. That will deload the stress off the hips, but you'll still have all that overload onto your quads. Because you're not wearing knee wraps at this point. Then you go ahead and put knee wraps on and you put the, let's say, squat brief on or just wear your single ply suit halfway down. Now you have overload on your spine. Take all that gear off. Now you go and squat. Well, you just squatted 150 pounds more. Mm -hmm. So you go back to raw, bang, bang. I just PR 20 pounds. I just PR 30 pounds. I've heard that, yeah. I, once I took off my suit and I started doing raw, I was like, this is crazy. Like, yeah. The transfer is amazing. Yeah, and it's just like wearing a slingshot. Yeah. So if you bench press with the slingshot for low overload practices, you should be doing that same thing with knee wraps, uh, doing the same thing with single ply suits or multi ply suits or squat briefs or pumpkin briefs or you need to use all these strength training tools. And it's all the same theory and practices of, of, of using chains, bands, bands in chains, different barbells, it's all different stresses on your lever systems. So, so not one thing is the right thing. It's Correct. a little bit of everything creates that strength. That strength, yes. Yeah. Okay. It's like you look at strongmen. Strongmen athletes you know, probably are more likely started in, in, in powerlifting. But you think about these strongman athletes that have never really powerlifted. Let's let's say uh, these these big guys that come from the farms. They just toss you know bales of hay and they're just lifting odd shape. Like you know. like Eddie Hall and all that. Guy. Yeah, yeah. You know they just lift a whole bunch of odd shape uh, heavy stuff, and it's just natural strength. And then they go and pick up a barbell, and they're already benching well over three hundred pounds for the first time in their life, and they've never bench pressed. It's just because strength. So if you can do that without powerlifting programming, um, you got you to also open your eyes to, shoot, why don't I go ahead and start practicing Atlas Stones? Why don't, why don't I go ahead and start practicing uh, lifting with, you know, doing bench pressing with the axle bar or overhead pressing with axle bars? Um, you know, farmer carries, uh, wheelbarrows, yoke racks, you should be able to add all that into your program. It's a strength training program, and a lot of people are programming for, let's say it's your first year in, in lifting. A lot of people are programming for a comp in, let's say, eight weeks. Mm -hmm. They're programming for a comp in 12 weeks or, or 36 weeks, whatever. 
you should be programming to be strong as heck over the next three years, over the next four years. Not just for the meat that's in front of you. A longevity thing. Okay. Okay. So what you do in this segment of the program is going to be completely, probably, if not, be completely different in the next segment of the program. And one of the things I see in this industry, in our sport, is a lot of people are bouncing coach to coach to coach to coach to coach. Because yeah. what people say, they see one program this way. Well, that coach does this, this program. Way. Well, who's to say that your current coach wasn't going to be like that? Mm -hmm. You know, so your current coach who's spent so much intimate time and who knows your weaknesses and knows your strengths, the moment you go to someone else to program you, you're not getting someone to know you intimately. And that's so important between picking a coach is that they know you intimately. They have to. You have to be real with that coach. Right. That person that from the one being coached to the coach. You right. Know? Yeah. yeah. That's a really good perspective, and that's true. A lot of people, I see them, and they'll get frustrated. I'll see that they did, they worked with the coach for two months. I didn't get a 25-pound PR, so I'm going to go to this guy. Right. I'm going to go to this guy. And that's dangerous because a lot of people consider themselves coaches, but they don't have the experience. They, they just see a big, strong guy, but right. that guy hasn't had experience, and... He could hurt you. It, it, you it, could, it, it could be detrimental. You could get yourself hurt. And you just got to be careful. You, That's you what I'm do. trying to say, man. That's what I'm trying to say. You have to have a... Tr I mean... Does it... We... This sport has been built off of athletes helping athletes. Yes. Okay? And athletes who only experience a meet or two or three or four, uh, sharing that with someone else, and, uh, you know, they end up as training partners together, and they go pretty far. They do very well, and there's 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 really nothing wrong with that. I don't have anything bad to say about, you know, coach this, coach that, coach this, mm -hmm. coach that. So, friends coaching friends, friends helping friends. You know, it, it's all part of a learning experience, and we all go through it. So, I don't really fault. You know, it, it's a lot different than saying, "Hey, I'm a track athlete, and I'm going to start coaching because I did my first I did my first track track competition, and now I'm going to start coaching on yeah. so many other people. It's, our sport is completely different from that. And it's because it's it's been grown by, hey, come train with me. Hey, come work out with me. And that person is learning and learning and learning how to work with multiple, multiples of people. The coaches that, that I feel, I'll say this, the coaches that, don't maintain an open mind to continue learning. Uh, those are the coaches that that will be very short lived in this sport. Yeah, I agree. So, you know, there's a lot of people that say, "Oh, you know, I've heard it. Lord Elliot doesn't know anything. He he thinks he knows more than he does. That's fine. Think that. That's really? okay. You know, that's okay. Think that. That's." Mm -hmm. I've gotten where I've gotten because of uh, what I know, what I've do, what I've done, and what I do. Um, and I wish you the best. <laughs> yeah, not everyone's so, going to be okay with your training or what you do, and that's that's, okay. that's fine. That's you fine. know, if, yeah. if you learn a science, I don't do anything that science doesn't back. Now, it's science, not hearsay, not bro science. If if science doesn't back it, I don't do it because in the end, I have to answer to somebody. Uh, and, and, and for, for what I do incorrectly. Yeah. And I can't just say, oh, because because uh, I do it like this and like that and I like this and because it works for me. Um, what I do for others, I, it's, it's it's not based on what works for me. It's based on what, what science says. Yeah. Um, are, are injuries inevitable? Are you it's, about to have injuries? Okay, so, I mean, I could say, I could say no. A lot of people would say no. I'd say injuries are inevitable. I mean, you could you could be walking downhill, you know, and straining your knee. Yeah. So you're 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 applying hundreds of pounds of force. Uh, once you're at ninety three percent, you know, it's kind of like a car. You have a red line of a car, and you're pushing that red line to push your car to max performance. Yeah. Anything can go wrong at that moment. And you're not even hitting the red line. Nope. 
Okay. You can be close to it, but you can be close to it, but something can go wrong, easily go wrong, because it's a significant amount of stress. So on our bodies, we deal with a significant amount of stress. It's bio, it's, so it has to heal. And sometimes it just doesn't heal, and we push our bodies harder and harder and harder. And um, it's inevitable. I've I've uh, torn my bicep. I've uh, I've been through three shoulder procedures since uh, July. I've had one hip procedure since July. Uh, I've had bulging I've had bulging discs for for a year that really uh, took me off the squats. Just just trying to step out of just trying to get out of bed was painful for a year. Um, had knee strains, you know. I've had yeah, it's it's so much. Mm. Uh, I actually perforated an ear drum from so much pressure from just the from weight. lifting. Yeah, and that was five five surgeries later. So it's 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 inevitable. There is injury prevention. You there is injury. There there's things you can do to minimize the cause of injury, uh, but. Uh, the main injury, anything can happen. You, you break that red line and it's gonna happen. Yeah. You know, the old guys, they always tell me, uh, you know, when I walk up, I say, oh, I've had this done, I've had that reattached. And then they say, oh, well, the next thing is to go is your hamstrings. So you already had your pec tear, you already had your bicep tear. Okay, well, the next thing that you're gonna have is your hamstring. So these are the, these are the old school guys. The old guys, yeah. So I'll guarantee you, Matt, you, even at this moment, and when I descend in the squat, oh God, please, please, please don't tear, please don't tear, please don't tear. By the time I get to the bottom, okay, I'm not worried about it anymore. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I'm always saying that to myself, you know, please don't break, please don't break. But you always go in knowing, you know, if it right. happens, it's, it's going to happen. If it happens, it's going to happen. Yeah, you can't really. It is what it is, you it know, is it's is, just, it, it, it's the love of things, it's. Ronnie always said, you know, I, I remember listening to Ronnie Coleman, and is there anything you regret? Oh, yeah, not taking that, that squat harder. Yeah, we're going for two, right? Yeah, he not said, going for two. Yeah, it was like a hit on your squat. He's like, I wish I would have gone for two. Yeah. 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 And I always think about that, too. Yeah. Especially when I'm on the platform, I'm like, come on, man, I wish I would have gone for it. If I don't, yeah. that's fine. And that's, that's, that's a historical champion yeah. saying that, you know? and. A lot of times we bail out psychologically. We bail out of our of our reps and our attempts because we want to maintain conservatorship. Could you have saved your injury? Absolutely. Could you have grown five five pounds of strength at that moment? Absolutely. But save it for another day. Mm -hmm. I agree. I've been in this for thirty years, thirty almost going on thirty one years, and and I'm still here. You know, you got got Louis Simmons says this sport has a life lifetime of four to six years. And, um, you know, it's, it's four to six years because people hit a, people hit, you know, you're only going to be so strong and you're never going to be strong enough. You're never, ever, ever going to be strong enough. So you're only going to get so strong, but how long can you sustain that strength? How long can you keep competing in a sport that gives you so much feedback and enjoyment? And, uh, that's the key. I think a lot of young guys never hear that right there. Yeah, that's the key. It's not four years from now. It's not, you know, I was just thinking as I was vacuuming uh, before you came over, I was just thinking to myself, um, you know, when, when, when <laughs> I, I just had a, a loss of thought, but, you know, this sport has given me so much in my life. Um, it's, it's all I've ever been doing. And over the years of competing, over the years of training and not training and stopping and starting and stopping and starting and bringing people involved in and what I do in the USPA, et cetera, et cetera. How strong is your mind? How strong are you mentally? Yeah. You know, how, how, how far do you want to go with your life? Are you going to quit? Are you going to keep going? So. You know, just just doing this with you here was 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 something that I, you know, what, why not? We're gonna have a good time talking, and hopefully, certain things I say will motivate people to keep going. You know, there's things that I hear from Lou Simmons. There's things that I hear from all all the big coaches in this sport, 
all the way from the 1990s Rockfather to even Steve Dennison. Mm -hmm. And um, you got to keep going. Yeah. Life doesn't end. You know, it, 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 you have to keep going. So this sport is something that I keep going. And it's just, I just have that passion for it. So, so I, you know, I see, I'm kind of, kind of change the topic, but not really. I see a lot of guys that have the strength, you know, like, let's say, you know, I see you, you have the strength, you have, like, I'm like, dude, you're so strong. You just need to tap that. You need to, you know, that, that, that tap that and get that out of you. But once they get on like on a platform or they get somewhere, you know, they have like a 600 deadlift, you know, mm -hmm. kind of, but they get on the platform and it's a 400, 450. And you know, it's a psychological thing. How do yeah. you get that? How do you get them out of that? How, do, how does someone get out of that? Do you, is there something that you do or just to kind of get you out of, you know, like I got this? But, yeah. Yeah. I have this thing I say, don't ever touch the bar until you're, unless you're ready to kill it. You know, we've all had the experience of we, we you, you ammonia up, you get slapped, you run out there, you grip the bar, you're angry, and then all of a sudden you have that moment of, oh man, this is heavy. Yeah. <laughs> you just have that moment. And then you see the person go underneath the bar, you see them back it out, and you can see they're they're scared, they're questioning it. They're they're not they're 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 in their head. And then they go down and they bail out on the squad and they get picked up and they pack it and they're disappointed, they're upset, they're, you know. The reality is it's either too heavy or you got scared, okay? And, and a lot of times the bar is just one pound too heavy. So if you miss it, you miss it. At least you went for it. So how do you get out of your head? This is something you gotta practice in training. I don't allow my athletes to slap i don't allow my athletes to take ammonia i see if that that's like the last thing that you'll ever have to use i don't i don't allow them if they if they train on it now when they're in that moment they have no other tools to get out of their head okay i see what you're saying because they're they rely on this but they have nothing else beyond that okay so you're looking for an adrenaline kick and sniffing that ammonia will give you that slight adrenaline kick, that anger. Well, I a lot of times will teach the use of tools. Think about something that was so tragic in your life that you got so angry and upset. I did that. You know, like um, my mother dying of cancer. Mm -hmm. uh, my, my grandfather's last words to me was, make your father proud. Make your, do things in your life that, that are going to make people proud of you. Um, you know, um, I, I think of things like that and I think of things that, that emotionally anger me, anger me and then I'll just put myself in that moment, I'll get really pissed off and angry and I'll take it out on the bar. Yeah. If I can't find myself in that spot, it's like an actor forcing themselves to cry. You know, it's, it's, you have to be that, put that hat on. And if I can't find that, all right, slap the shit out of me, you know. Let's do it. Let's smoke some. Uh, let's smoke up some uh, ammonia, and and do whatever I can to get out of my head. And yeah. at that moment, okay, that will work. You okay, know? That, I understand that. Yeah. So, that's it's it's a fact of fear. And I don't know. You you play you played soccer. Yeah. Okay. So soccer is a team sport. Powerlifting is an individual sport. Mm -hmm. Soccer is, we need a goal. We need a goal to win. And the team looks to one person or two people, and usually it's the best people on the, on the team yeah. for that. And you know, that person that everyone's relying on, was that ever you? No, I, okay. uh, especially soccer, I was all right. too slow. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so everyone has a job, but they're all relying on that Michael Jordan effect, the Michael Johnson, uh, Magic Johnson effect, okay? So, you're that one individual that has to just grit their teeth, amp up, and attack, and keep attacking and attacking and attacking until there's nothing in your way except you and that goal. Whether you got 
kick the goal or whether you're basketball and you got to sink that basket, right? Yeah. See what I'm saying? Do you feel that? Yeah, I know. Yeah. You grit your teeth and you're just, just like, let's go. We let's go. This. Yeah. So because you play team sport, you don't stop until the whistle blows. Mm-hmm. You know, in powerlifting, you don't stop until you give it all. You're, you're laying it all out there. If you feel your bicep tear, you're still gone. If you feel your hamstring tear and you feel that burning sensation about to, you're still going. You're like, I'm here. Let's go. Yeah. You know, I'll deal with the injury afterwards, but you're still going. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. But if you can finish it, great. If you don't, it is what it is. So, in, you know, you don't stop until you hear the whistle blow. You don't stop until you hear the, 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 the crowd cheer. You don't stop until you hear the screams of everybody you know, with adrenaline, just trying to channel it, channel that to you to keep going. Yeah. And that's what it is. You know, powerlifting is that sport. Powerlifting is a sport of nobody wants to see anybody fail. Yeah. You know, I remember my 2010 national championship. I, I was competing against a world champion. And um, I didn't want to see him fail any of his lifts. So here I am standing on the side. You know, cheering him on. Yes, he got it. Damn it. I just took a second. <laughs> you know? I've done that. Yeah. You know? But this is, that's this sport. It's exciting. I, you see, you see you the biggest, see you know, you see the biggest lifters in the sport do the same thing. Mm -hmm. They're, they're up there. They're kind of nervous that they're going to get it, but they don't want to see him miss it. But, you know, it's also $10,000 they just lost. Yeah. So it's kind of like, yeah, I do want to see it. When I was at Worlds, uh, there's some coaches that can, that, that, that witnessed me getting to my USA team, my goal, my responsibility is for USA to win number one. My second responsibility is securing, which is by securing Wilkes. So I have to know that they can achieve a weight to maximize Wilkes, that they're not gonna try to waste two and a half kilos. No, I need those two and a half kilos. So if you're making a 10 kilo jump, but I know, guarantee you, I can get five kilos out of you, uh, we're going five kilos. So there was moments where I've had the athletes that were just going neck to neck. It was a two and a half kilo difference. And so I am doing psyops warfare hmm. on my athlete's opponent. And I'm getting into the head, I'm talking loud enough that that, way, that bar is really heavy. That's heavy, it's too heavy for you. You have to jump that much, your warm ups looked hard. Dang. So I was walking over to these athletes and telling them these things and getting into their heads. Mm -hmm. And I would walk over to the, you know, to the iron comp board and I would be pointing at the athlete and I'd be pointing here on and pointing at their name and then making it gesturing that we are going to do this. They're going to do that, you know, and, and make it feel like I'm talking about them. So sometimes you win, sometimes you lose, but you, you have to do that sometimes. You have to get into the athlete's heads. If you want to win, you have to do that. That's interesting. You grow up and never to go against you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it is what it is, but in the end, it's, it's about winning. And if, yeah. you're at, if you as an athlete are not mentally strong enough to handle that, then that's your fault. That's something you've got to work on. That's something you got to work on. Yeah. you got to overcome, you know? you got to be like, I'm not listening to this guy. Whatever. Yeah. It's cool. Whatever. Yeah. It's always fun going against people. And even though they're like, when I've gone on the platform and I see guys that I'm going against, I'll cheer them on there. You got to. Yeah. It's, it's exciting to see someone deadlift 300, 400, whatever, 800 pounds. It's always fun. Yeah. It's always fun. You never get over it. Like I yeah. never get over it. It's been like three years and I'm like, every time I'm there, I'm like, yeah. Yeah. And I'm like, shit. shit. <laughs> so I don't know about back then. Like, you know, when you first started powerlifting and everything. But nowadays, I see a lot of guys doing water cuts to make up, to make weight. Uh -huh. And I'll see them do drastic water cuts, yeah. like 20 pounds. I've seen a guy do 30 pounds, and he'll come back onto the platform, and he's like, you can say he's not fully there. He hasn't recovered. He hasn't recovered. Have you ever done that? or have um, you I have. Too? I have. I've wrestled. Um, I wrestled my junior, my uh, junior high years in high school. And... So I've had practice doing that. Um, you need to practice this. Your body has to understand, ha has to be trained in it. Uh, 
Yeah. So you can't just do a water cut, come back the next day, and still think that you can perform like yeah, you were. Yeah. If you've been doing it for a long time, you've been practicing it like these UFC fighters, they'll do 20, 20 pound water cuts, 25 pound water cuts, and they rehydrate, but they've practiced this yeah. over and over and over to know how to perform in competition. So it's the same thing in, in our sport. You have to practice to know how to perform, how your body's gonna perform in competition. It's kind of like, what's the point of getting so strong just to do a water cut and lift a significant amount of less weight that you've been training for. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, if you're already lean, low body fat percentage, and you're just doing water cut, that's one thing. But if you're, if you have a, a, a significant amount of body fat and you're trying to do a water cut, you know, that's another thing. It's, it's kind of like, let's take the body fat off so it makes the reduction of weight a lot easier. You, you might as well just be at that weight. Yeah. yeah, so you might as well just reduce the body fat and then do your water cut. So mm -hmm. you have to practice it. There's nothing wrong with it. Um, it's all part of competition, especially these guys are going for a $40,000 purse, you know, $50,000 purse, etc. $10,000 purse. It's, it's all part of sport and comp. Mm -hmm. And you're laying it out there. And you have to push yourself to these limits if this is your goal. Yeah. I agree with that. Yeah. So going off of that, do you, as a, as a power lifter, do you all do you have to have a little bit of fluff? A little? No, no, <laughs> no, you don't. That's yeah. Because a lot like, of guys say that, but no, no, not one bit. It's it's just it's it's what you want to be, who you want to be. It's your choice. It's your decision. You know, you have uh, you look at Stephanie Cohen, phenomenal physique, an uh, amazing lifter. Amazing lifter. Yeah. You've got uh, CC Ingram. Amazing lifter. Oh, yeah, Phenomenal. Too. So, you know, you, you got these, um, you got these ripped and shredded power lifters. And they're performing, you know, Dan Green. My gosh, you know. So you got they're all incredible. these incredible power lifters. I, I mean, I, I don't mean to leave anybody out, but, you know, it's just. Off the top of the head Off right the top now. of my head. These yeah. are, these are images of people I see. So, that, that, that's just your choice. It's, it's what you want to choose. Um, you know, you have these big time powerlifters that, that weigh in the super heavies, they cut down the 308s, they cut down the 275s, and they're performing just as strong as when they're in the, three, the super heavies. And they're, they're moving better, less congestion in, in, in the body, heart congestion, <laughs> less less compression, so they can actually breathe better, they recover faster. Um, you know, and again, you have to retrain the body under those stress loads, because your belt has to get tighter. Uh, you don't have the squishiness in your, in your abdominal area to create a, a strong brace. So you have to retrain what, what it's like to do a force brace when you're as lean as you are. Uh, you know, you look at Chris Duffin, the age he is and at the uh the he is a pretty lean guy mm -hmm. and he has a very strong you know trunk muscular trunk um squatting over 900 pounds though yeah <laughs> like it's nothing deadlifting over 900 so you know do you have to have fluff no that's that's just your choice that's just yeah guys it's a choice i have a choice because i want to have the fluff <laughs> yeah it's a choice i mean you know I enjoy eating peanut M Ms and I enjoy you know, eating popcorn and pizza and hot dogs and and having all that with nacho cheese sauce, you know. And, <laughs> and it's a choice. So, but if I want to cut down to a lower weight class, I will. If I don't, I won't. It's, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so to get for a guy that for a person or a girl, whatever, it's is it really important to have your nutrition on point? Yes. In order to be in powerlifting. In order to, well, in any sport, of course, but yeah. in powerlifting, you know? So, it's kind of like ask yourself the question, why would you want to throw away a, uh, a, a phenomenal two-hour training session by eating Twinkies before? Yeah. You know? Why would you just want to do that? A lot of times, if you ate Twinkies before, you're probably not going to have a great training session. Um, I see all these uh, honey bears and, gummy bears and 
Oh, like sour patches. Sour and patches and donuts eaten before. And, I mean, you're only on that platform for a few lifts. Yeah. You know, so you know it's a lot different than running a marathon. It's a lot in, in your glycogen levels. It's a lot different. So it's funny to me to watch it. But will you perform better off eating apples? Will you perform better off eating a a a, 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 a banana or a, Correct. Rice yeah. or right. yeah. rather than eating chocolate donuts and and etc. So yeah, the answer is gonna be obviously yes. But if you this is the way you've trained, and then also on a meat day, which I've seen so many times before, yeah. on meat day everyone decides to eat healthy. A lot of people decide to eat healthy and all of a sudden they're they're really gassy and they have to they, their 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 fecal evacuations are completely off time, all because they decide to eat completely different on meat day so if you want to be at optimal levels eat at an optimum nutritional level yeah. you know that's, that's bottom line and it's not hard to change it's it's a choice mm -hmm. it's a choice uh before i remember uh competing with the marine corps team that my father coached and you know we would be competition night the night before comp and we'd all go out to dinner for and we'd have some guys that would want to eat Chinese food because that's their ritual. That's how they 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 perform best by eating a, a ritual that they've eaten, which is Chinese food. Mine was always steak. The night before, I was I was raised. This is my ritual. This is the way I perform. The best performance is is a, a very high quality steak. So, you know, it's got to be practiced. Yeah. It's got to be practiced. It's knowing yourself too. Yeah. That's very true. Very, very true. <clears throat> wait, wait, I lost my page. Hmm. I lost my page. <laughs> That's where I was at. I got, I got so into it that I just, boom. Oh, what was running through your mind? Do you remember your first meet and what was running through your mind? Um, yeah, I, I very much do. Um, I was scared. I was nervous. I was scared. Uh, you know, my father, there, there's high expectations to accomplish and achieve. Mm -hmm. And my father always had to believe in me. And um, he was always in my head. So he would never call numbers for me that he knew I couldn't do. So if I missed a number, I knew that was on me. It wasn't on him. So this is the way I was raised. I remember one competition. Um, it was a national championship. And before going up, I started having a anxiety attack. I started hyperventilating. I started panicking. Um, I had no control of my physical being and psychologically I just start crying and emotionally start crying and I was telling my father I couldn't do it so he literally picked me up by my belt and, and took me out the back and he just he's he you know, he's trained to understand what people go through you know, <laughs> shock so he immediately became the voice in my head and he started talking me down and started talking me to breathe. And we started doing some yoga exercises and some kind of like mental, um, what do you call it, meditations and breathing meditations. Uh, immediately he had me on that. And the yoga practices I found out later, they were actually Tai Chi exercises he was putting me through. So he basically just picked me up. I was already suited. Pick, just pick me up like <laughs> like like uh, sumo wrestlers. You know? Come on, <laughs> yeah. Uh, pick each, pick each other up by their under or whatever they call it, diapers. I don't know, but they pick and he just dragged me outside, and he got me in my head, and I went I went eight for nine on that meet. Cool. Yeah, I missed my last deadlift because I lost the grip on my hand, but yeah, I went eight for nine on that. Hit all three squats. I PR'd on everything, and, and uh, it was an amazing moment. It was a big, huge teaching moment for me. That's good. You've I bet you've took that yeah. a long way. You ran with that. Oh, yeah. absolutely. 
Absolutely. With that. That's cool. Do you still do Tai Chi or anything like that? No, no I don't. No? So, but I, I'll still practice a lot of things that he taught. That's cool. And over the years, I've obviously have come in with different techniques. And, yeah. You know. do, you, do you feel that it's important that if you really want to get far in a sport, when powerlifting sport, is it really important to have a coach? It is. Uh, it is. It's, you, you need a coach. You need a coach. Not, and a coach is not just someone that programs you. Mm-hmm. Because programming is pretty simple. It's, a coach is someone that, can, that you can respond to uh, have how to make you better. All right? Because a lot of times, and I see it all the time, you have to be intimate with your coach. You have to be trusting with your coach. And you have to, you have to make sure that you're not, let's say, you know, like I train, I train my girlfriend Peyton. And Peyton understands that, you know, boyfriend hat comes off, coach hat comes on. So I'm there in the best interest of her. But if her girlfriend cat, cat hat comes on and I tell her something that's very true and, and that's, that could offend her. But as a coach, I'm not doing it to offend you. But as a boyfriend, that would be offensive. Yeah. You know? Mm-hmm. So with my coach hat on, if she puts her girlfriend cap on and I say what I say to her, and she, that's not going to work. Mm-hmm. You have to keep your athlete hat on. Yeah. So, a coach is there to be in the be- in your best interest. It's going to be the voice that you can't say to yourself. It's going to be the honesty that you can't be to yourself. And you need someone like that. Everybody does. Plus, a coach's experience is going to help you be better on the platform as well. Yeah, I agree. You know, it, it doesn't have to be specifically saying coach it could be two best friends that are looking out for each other yeah they do uh, going in a learning experience yeah. together yeah yeah i get that I hey man i learned this i saw this what do you think oh man let's try it thanks for having my back you know so you just need someone there to be in the best interest of you that's always good do you um do you have any competitions that you're going to be competing against you yeah i am I'm uh, going to go for the California State Drug Tested uh, uh, Championships out in Chino Hills. Um, and, and I'm doing that to qualify for the North Americans uh, out in Costa Mesa in California to drug test the North Americans at, mm-hmm. in November. Uh, but if it, if it allows me to qualify me or not, if I don't qualify with the class, uh, class one, what I'll do is compete at uh, the Coveted Open in April to qualify for Class 1. If I end up coaching the team in Germany, the drug tested, uh, the ITL cool. drug tested team That's in so Germany. That's so cool that you're going after Germany. If I, get, if I get that opportunity or I'll go to the non-tested Ireland team. Or, uh, this year, uh, for 2020, uh, my goal was not to be the head coach in 2020. 2019 was going to be my last year. Uh, because my my goal as the director of uh, coaches certification program, I'm also direct that also umbrellas me over who coaches the U.S. team. I wanted to bring in other people to coach to get that experience mm-hmm. that I have, and all of a sudden they get the experience, and then when they do, they get to branch out and take that experience and help grow the sport of the USPA. You know, I so, appreciate that. I love how you're not. It's you don't want to be, a, you don't want to be the guy at the top all the time. You want to give other people an experience. Right. You're you're doing it for the love of the sport. That's what doing I'm doing it for say. the love of sport and doing it for the love of of athletes. You know, and I, I I don't I don't want to be the guy like this guy. I don't want to be that guy. I want to be the guy that's that, that's in front of everybody. Like, hey, let me show you guys how to do this, and let's all do it together, and we grow. Yeah, you know, I, I got into this to grow the sport. I didn't get into this to be this guy that everybody looks up to. That's that's not what I want to do. You know, I, you know, you look at my social media compared to a lot of other uh, coaches out there, and I'm just not that guy. So that was my goal for 2020: is I'll do I'll be doing one one team, and I'm going to bring in another coach to to, to coach another team. 
And then by 2021, I want to step out to be able to bring in head coaches and say, this is the system, this is what we're running, and what do you have to bring to the table to help this team? Yeah. And and then this is what I can do to help you to maximize this opportunity because it's all about winning the gold. You know, I'm three for three winning the gold, and I don't want to let that go because I've already got the other teams telling me, hey, we're going to take you next year, we're going to take you next year, and I'm going to say, no. You It'll never right happen. Mm -hmm. I've got the best of the best. I am I am the United States. We are the best of the best, and there's no one that can beat us. Awesome, man. You know, so we go with that, we go with that attitude. But that's my goal. So if I can compete with the team at the non at the drug tested in Germany, that would be fantastic. And, but I'll still come home and I'll do the North Americans in Costa Mesa. That's cool. That's really that's awesome. If I could, I would go to Germany and just yeah. to go see, but that's crazy. That's a whole different thing. Um, is there anyone you ever you really want to train with that you see and you're like, dude, if I had a chance to train with this guy, I would. It could be anyone in history. I don't know. Do you have anyone? You know, my, my, my first reaction when you say that is, it's just going to push me to work harder, and I just don't want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> but obviously, if I had that opportunity, I, I would be pushed. I, it would push me to work hard. Because the excitement's in the room and the energy's in the room, and and a lot of times, you know, when I'm running the gym at night, you know, we have we have a significant amount of teams coming in at night, and they're all training. So you know, it's it's kind of what what has been created is a uh, you know the hype crew. Mm -hmm. So you'll have a team over here and a team over here, and it'll be me and Peyton that are training. And when Peyton and I are going for maxes, this team will these teams will support us, and when they're going for maxes. We'll be supporting them. It's that energy, that hype it's energy. It's just the that hype have. energy, and it. Is there anyone I really enjoy training with Peyton? Um, she's probably been one of the best workout partners, and uh, someone that's always had my back uh, during training that I've I've had in a long time. Other than my friends, I've always been there for me. But someone I can be intimate with on a. Uh, on a coaching level, be intimate with, constantly there, um, you know, trustworthy, and someone who's always there. We, we talk almost every night about our program, and, and uh, it, I really enjoy that. That's awesome. Like, you know, uh, going over to other teams and, and hanging out with other teams, that's a lot of fun too. Um, I do that, I enjoy doing that, but, you know, I, I prefer to, to be you're to happy with my training. You're partner. happy where you're at. Yeah. yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. That's cool. And for you to recognize that and appreciate that. That's always cool because yeah. not a lot of people have someone to train with. Or do you think that training with someone is always better than training alone? Or it, does it depend yes on no. what mindset? Yeah. Yeah. Yes and no. You know, um, you know, does, does the attention on me is sometimes the attention on me needs to be greater than attention on Peyton. Sometimes the attention on Peyton needs to be greater than the attention on me. Mm -hmm. So when I'm on when I'm on a uh, a lower standard setting and she's on a higher expectation, that works. So anytime we program, I'm not programming to to be at the same expectation levels and and as she's on. So let's say if I'm on a uh, eight rep hard max and she's on a three rep hard max, I don't have to have as much attention on me. As, as she will need on her own. Yeah, I agree. So it works that way. It works really well that way. And it just it's just something that we found to work for us. That's good. How do you, do you, uh, how do you stop yourself from ego lifting? <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I was told, I learned that lift with an ego. Lift with an ego. Lift with an ego. Just don't have an ego. Yeah. Just don't live your ego, you know? You gotta live, you, you've gotta be, you, you have to feel like you are Superman or Superwoman. You have to feel like you're gonna overcome, you know, these great feats of strength. You do. If you don't walk into believing that, that you are gonna be doing something that's, that's that, 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 if you have doubt in your head, mm -hmm. You know, um, don't do it. Yeah. You've got to be cocky. You've got to be confident. You have to have an ego. If, and and you've got you to gotta believe in yourself. 
And whatever it takes to do that, to achieve that one PR, whether it's rep PR or max PR, whatever it is, you have to believe in yourself. If you don't, then you're not going to get for it. Now, you achieve it and you step off of there, mm -hmm. even if it's a 300 pound max PR, 300 pound, and you say, I'm the strongest in the world, and you walk around like you're, you know, you're bulletproof. Well, you don't need to do that. Yeah, you don't have to go be that guy. Right. You don't yeah. have to be that, that girl. Guy. Yeah. Or that girl. Yeah. Do you think that uh, the way athletes are now differ from how they were like back then? Have they changed? They're all still the same. same. They're all meetings. We just have a lot more of it. <laughs> um, you know, the coaches that coached me or I've been around are still saying the same exact things as the coaches back then. Yeah. You know? And the coaches today and the athletes today are still doing and doing the same exact things as back then. They can achieve squat depth. Mm -hmm. Okay, squat depth still seems to be an issue. Um, <laughs> following commands still seems to be an issue. And whether you hitch or not hitch, or whether you rest bar on thigh, that still seems to be an issue. Okay. <laughs> People are still missing their opening attempts because it's too heavy. It, it hasn't changed. So, so the first the first attempt, um, uh, the first attempt, do you think it's okay to kind of like do a, what would you recommend for people that want to do the first attempt? Because some people do overshoot it or they undershoot it. <laughs> yeah. What's the perfect medium? Just so the biggest thing out there is something you can triple should be your first attempt, your opening attempt. And if you think about something you can triple, it's still a grinder. Mm -hmm. All right. So if you triple... Let's say 300 pounds. That gives you a one rep max of about, let's say, 325, 330. Or 320, 325, 330, depending upon. That's still a grinder. You know? So if you opened up with, let's say, something you can do 85% or five reps of, let's just say. And uh, it's going to be a lot less. It's, so let's say it's uh, 285. And then let's say you go 310, and then you go 320. It's a lot less volume, a lot less stress on the body. and But you have to train that too. Yeah. In training, you have to do these jumps in training so that you are accustomed to these jumps to do it in comp. Just don't walk in a comp without training to know how to pattern your, your program in, in comp. You know, so you have to practice these things, but especially for a newbie who they're already nervous, they're probably dehydrating because they're nervous, they're nerves, and they're 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 not rehydrating, they're constantly peeing, so they, they get tired of peeing, so they stop drinking and they're just dehydrating. And then their anxiety kicks in and then they walk onto the platform and they see the crowd. And if you're used to squatting in the squat rack and you're not used to squatting in the combo rack. Um, you feel very naked yeah, because you're not enclosed. So you have to take all these other things in consideration. A lot of times you're squatting on rubber or hardwood floor and you're not used to squatting on carpet. So your feet don't drag the same, your step out, your movements don't do the same thing. So everything is foreign. So if you're in a, a severe, a, a high level, submax level, you know, and you're expecting your athlete to perform as easy as they do in training it's not gonna happen so something so it's got to be light enough for you to truly be able to manage that weight and not to be so stressful that you miss the weight you got to be really confident within yourself or as a coach within your athlete that you're giving them a number that's going boom got it let's move on to the next level you know, competition's a test. And if you're gonna give your, if you're gonna challenge your athlete at a high strenuous test level when it doesn't have to, you know, you, you, you need to ease back and think about, well, if it's my first time athlete, I need to think more about, do you wanna be sitting in the car, let's say, boyfriend, girlfriend. Mm -hmm. All right, boyfriend's a coach, girlfriend's an athlete, boyfriend, calls for these numbers that they call for in the gym, but all these other issues happen, these environmental issues happen, and she misses her opening attempt. 
you're gonna want to sit in that car with her because it's your fault, and she's emotional. Yeah. Does a boyfriend really want to be in with her in that car with her yelling at him, putting him down? Oh, because, <laughs> you know, and not only that, but then she's thinking about you know all the detrimental selves about herself and I'm not good enough, blah blah blah. Why don't you focus more on giving something that they can achieve, guarantee to achieve, and have positive feedback, and then in that car she's going to say. That was such an incredible, incredible experience. I can't wait for my next one. It's crazy all the things are taken into account that I've, I have never thought of. Wow. Yeah. So I would rather be in the car with someone that did, who can max out at 330 pounds, but she only achieved 300 pounds at the, at, at the comp. Even though it was less, she's always going to say, I could have done more, which is a lot better than saying, why didn't I get that? Because there's always another comp. There's 30 years of it. There's the rest of your life. The comp doesn't end at that comp. There's a next one. But that's all part of coaching and that's all part of programming. We are, we are training to get to the national championships, which is, let's say we do it in 18 months. In order to do that, we have to go through all these meets. Okay, meet directors, especially at meet, myself as a meet director, I always... Uh, sanction my events when you're out. So if you ever look at the USPA calendar, all my sanctions are purchased. They're so there. they're already they're already on the calendar. So when you're looking at your one year mark, you can go and pick three to four meets over one year and go ahead and register for that. That's interesting. That's cool. So when you're programming, this is how you program. You program all the way out. So, yeah. So these are just stepping stones to get you to the national championship. These are the big, the big now you're a national big. level competitor. Uh -huh. Then you only really do, once you're a national level competitor, you really only do two qualifying meets, a national level, and then start working towards an expo or, or some kind of an expo or a pro event or a world event. Hmm. So, but you got to gain the experiences. Ken Wheeler, he's been a mentor of mine for umpteen amount of years, almost two decades now. And he said, you're not, you're still a novice lifter until you lift in your 20th meet. Until your 20th meet. Until your 20th meet. And a lot of people say to themselves, wow, that's a long time. Well, you don't think you'll be learning? You don't think pro football players who have been in the, in the league for 15 years, 10 years, they are not still learning. Yeah, they're all still learning. You're, st I'm still learning, even with all the experience I have. With, you know, okay, so I have a hundred. I have a hundred athletes I've experienced with. Uh, what's my what What's my knowledge going to be with a thousand athletes over ten years, over twenty years? What's my experience going to be with two thousand athletes over thirty years? What's my experience going to be with four thousand athletes? So, I'm still learning. And it's just a process thing. So it's a progress over over perfection. Uh -huh. Progress over perfection. Yeah. Dude, I could sit here and talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> I could seriously just <laughs> I could be here all day just listening to you. It's incredible, dude. Thank you again for uh, letting me come down here and uh, yeah, yeah. Um, let's see. <laughs> so what do you? Do you like out of the gym, are you like? Do you mentor mentor in other things? Um, I'm yeah. always trying to mentor. I'm always trying to be the the person who who wants to see people succeed. It's a good feeling. Um, it's a great feeling. Yeah, you know, it, it's really up to the individual to put themselves forward. Um, I've already done it. I've 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 lived a phenomenal life already. I've lived a phenomenal career, and I'm still going to keep living it. But. What I had to do to get there was a lot. I had to do things that I never thought I could ever do. And that's one thing you gotta understand is you just don't know what you just don't know. Cause I didn't know I'd be here a year from now, a year ago. Mm -hmm. And when I look back at my decade, I started 2010, I started in 2000, October 2010, I started my, my personal training business out of my garage. 
and I finished my bachelor's degree and then I went on to my master's and I finished my master's in 2012. In 2013, I launched the NASCAR education system. 2014, uh, we launched it with the USPA. 2015, became a meet director and opened up NASCAR. 2016, we grew NASCAR. 2017, I went from meet directing four meets, three to four meets a year to, to nine meets a year. 2018, we did 19. 2017, we did, or in 2018, we did uh, like 18 coaching certs. Uh, you know, so, at the end of 2019, last year, you know, last year in December, when I look back at my decade, wow, you just don't know what you don't know. Yeah, you just keep going. You just got to keep putting one foot in front of the other and doing the things it takes you to learn the minimum requirements. The minimum requirements to get, bachelor is to get a bachelor's degree. The minimum requirements is to get my master's degree. Those are minimum requirements. And did I need the degree to be able to do what I did? No, I could have read the books and saved myself uh, almost $80,000 and just spent a couple grand on just the books. Yeah. You know? So, but if I didn't do these things to push myself through uh, the minimum requirements, I would not, I wouldn't open up opportunities, doors of opportunities without it. So. That's what a lot of people just don't understand. That's what a lot of people need to do. Is they just need to have the drive and the, the wants and the desires to to do more for themselves. Yeah, and I think you do it. You love it. It's yeah. something you love and you've always done, so you'll keep going. Yeah. Yeah. Is there, before we end this, is there anything you want to say like to people out there or <laughs> just something that's been on your mind? I mean, there's a lot I could say, but... Um, it, it's really having, uh, I had a discussion just last night and all your wills and desires are within you. You don't have to have someone tell you, you don't need someone to believe in you. If you want it, put your left foot in front of your right and go for it. You know, we all talk about, I want to be this. We all talk about, I want to be that. It's within you to do it. Not all of us will get there. Not all of us will be the strongest in the world. Not all of us will be the world champion. But the experiences you get along that journey, um, you're going to find and discover so many things about yourself that it could open up doors of opportunities that, that you never thought would be available to you. But you still have to put one foot in front of the other and have the desire and the discipline to keep going. And that's it, that's the bottom line. You could keep talking about it, talking about it, talking about it, but without you moving forward and, and achieving and, and doing the minimum things uh, of self-discipline, it's just all words. And that's one thing about powerlifting, that once you step into, don't worry about your diet. If you're a first time lifter, mm -hmm. if you've never powerlifted before, don't worry about diet, okay? Worry about getting to the gym. Worry about tying your shoes to get to the gym. Once you're at the gym, then you start challenging yourself in repetitions in the sets. You will get stronger no matter what. Yeah. Okay, whether you're, you're, you're strengthening it with a barbell to from a 45 pound bar to 50 pounds to 55 pounds, you'll get stronger no matter what. Once you build those disciplines, that becomes putting on your shoes and getting to the gym becomes easy. Now you have a desire to do it. Eventually, you'll start wanting to fix your nutrition. And once you fix your nutrition, then you'll start performing at higher levels of performance. And then things will mold in from there. But you gotta keep going and pushing yourself and pushing yourself. In life, it's the same thing whether you're competing or whether you're trying to get to a different career or build your career or build your product, it's the same thing. You have to keep going. You have to start small, build those disciplines. It becomes easy. Then you can start stacking on more things. It's like building a house. And you start with the concrete, you start with everything. Yep. It's incredible. You start with a small house and all of a sudden you're building a two-story house, then you're building a mansion. That's awesome. You know? <laughs> yeah. So... 
that's the way it is in life. So powerlifting relates to very, very much a lot of the same behaviors in life. I learned that it's it's pushed me in different yeah. directions that I don't think I don't think that without it I would have not gone right forward. I mean I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't be in Bakersfield right now. Right. You know? yeah. yeah. Seriously. No, and like I said, well, not all of us will get there because competition is hard. It's 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 hard, but you gotta keep pushing forward because sometimes people just aren't strong enough to mm -hmm. continue on. And if you built that discipline and strength within you to continue on, there's nobody else but you. So that's also another part of life, you know? Mm -hmm. All right, guys, I'm gonna leave it off with that. We can keep going, but this is awesome. <laughs> thank you again, seriously. Yeah. Thank you so Absolutely. much. Absolutely, um, thank you. You're incredible, you're very inspirational. <laughs> Just talking with you for like an hour, it's open up a whole new mindset within me. So it's good. I appreciate it. And I hope a lot of you guys get a lot of good insight. And uh, all right, guys, later. Bye. Dude, awesome, man. You're awesome, dude. <laughs> you're incredible. That was an hour and a half. <laughs> yeah. I want to...